Welcome to Matters of Decorum. I'm Scott Corum. This is What Matters to Me. Role-playing games. I've talked a little bit about what I think makes a good role-playing game and a bad role-playing game, and now I'm going to talk about what it's like when I make a role-playing game. A little history. Around 2007, I was making art products for the RPG market, paper standees, uh, through drivethroughrpg.com. Uh, I just finished my novel that I was writing during the filming of The Dungeon Masters. And when you write a novel and you write every day, you sit down and you just make words come out, you don't really want to stop. I was probably close to the top of my writing game at the time, and I figured, you know, I was upset enough with what was happening in the role-playing game market at the time, with The Curse of the Fourth Edition, I figured, I'll write a role-playing game. Sat down with my friend Victor Gibson, and we started hammering some stuff out. The first game that we designed was called Duo Dodecahedron. It was a brilliant system that utilized the bell curve you get when you roll two 12-sided dice. And, oh my god, did it just not work. It, you know, first of all, you know, relying on people to go out and buy two 12-sided dice to have their game, not the most common die out there, not people... Yeah, I like it when people get to use all their dice, but not what I was going for. So we settled on a system that would use a d20. And uh, that system was going to be uh, something that flowed off of the products I was already using online. I marketed a set of paper standees called Hot Chicks. Uh, then I marketed a set of paper standees called Hot Dudes. Hot Dudes sold two or three copies, and Hot Chicks sold a dozen, dozens, as time went on. I put out a Hot Chicks 2, it sold dozens, a Hot Chicks 3, it sold dozens, so I started to see a pattern. As time went on, publishing the Hot Chicks stuff, we did art books, and there were suggestions of uh, a game world forming in there, so we wrote a book. We wrote Hot Chicks the role-playing game. It was supposed to be just a, a, a lark. A, a joke product, uh, a way for me to put some pretty pictures on paper and have people roll dice, and it was all going to be light and hearty, and geez, I could not write a light book. This monster is 454 pages long. Uh, through Lulu.com, because this is a color print, this costs $100 to buy in print in demand online. Oh my god. I figured the title would not only be a little tongue-in-cheek, but it might generate some controversy. Hey, hot chicks, people might talk about that. And aside from some decent reviews and a uh, long conversation on RPGNet that eventually ended with the mods having to close it down and some people getting banned from ever using the net again, yeah, the response was meh. But, oh my gosh, did we flesh this thing out. I didn't want to write a simple role-playing game, as it turns out. I wanted to write something that would make people jump up and scream and shout. And we did. It's based heavily in the cinematics of the 1980s. Uh, bad 80s cinema, for the most part. The stuff that just got your heart pumping, even when it didn't make any sense. Had aliens and demons and huge mega corporations and robots and ninjas. And it's 454 pages long because I didn't want anyone to get the book and think that they couldn't do something with it. Well, this is great, but what if I want a person who can throw magic? So there's magic. What if I want a cyborg? There's cybernetics. How about some kung fu so I can kick through walls and be on a wire? And well, that's in there too. Guns and swords and knives and every kind of car and vehicles and battleships and airplanes. It's a lot of stuff. It's 454 pages worth of stuff. The stuff and the game world was really engaging. I still like it. We're still using it. I'll get to that. The system, however, was where the rubber met the road. As I'd seen a number of systems go belly up, try to appeal to people and just tank so hard because of the mechanics. I didn't want to 
lose customers to mechanics. I don't want someone to pick this up and go, this is too complicated, or this isn't complicated enough, or this is too grainy, or this is too coarse. You're not going to make everyone happy when you design a game. Well, I didn't try to make everyone happy. I tried to make me happy. I tried to write the game that me and Vic would want to play. We still use the system. I didn't want people to have to go to charts. I wanted someone to get their character sheet, set it down in front of them, and they had all the numbers they needed. I didn't want everything to be the same as in other games, going for high numbers and seeing if you can't stack things up and taking it above the top. I didn't want an unlimited exploding system because they're unlimited and exploding, and at some point in time, everything just kind of gets a little ridiculous. You know, run into problems with progression and people being able to automatically do everything they want to do without there being any challenge. And challenge is always going to be a part of it. Most of all, I didn't want people rolling a dice and then spending 15 minutes figuring out what it meant. That meant there are not going to be any target numbers. That meant that there wasn't going to be any chart referencing in the middle of combat. The mechanic had to be smooth and fast, and it had to be neatly encapsulated in the information someone already had on the character sheet. So, the original system that we came up with, the inverted 20 system, uh, uses a single d20. High numbers are bad, low numbers are good. 20 is a critical failure, 1 is a critical success. Exactly the opposite of how the numbering goes in a standard d20 game. If you have a stat, you have a skill. There are six stats and a bucket of skills. You add your stat, which goes from anywhere from four to ten, to your skill, which goes from anywhere from not having it to a six, seven if you're specially talented. Take your total number, and that is your target. You're trying to get that or under on the d20. You add bonuses for having the right equipment or especially well-made weapons or you take penalties for it being dark or being under stress or having difficulty at that time and boom you've got your number roll make it now that's a flat line distribution now if you roll a d20 there is every chance you're going to roll a one and every chance you're going to roll a 20 a five percent chance to roll any number on that die across the board. So it's kind of hard to tell if you're going to succeed or not. Higher stats, higher skill means you have a greater chance of success and always that little chance of failure. That's why the maximum possible stat plus skill combination is a 17. But in the movies of the 80s, if someone really tries to do something, they get it done. It might I mean, they've got to grunt and groan and scream a little bit harder, but they get it done. You got to make that jump over the drawbridge? Well, it's going to be tight, but yeah. Well, how do you represent that in a flatline distribution? How do you have someone able to just do what they're trying to do? Other game systems had, at that point in time, included resources that players and characters could burn to get a little bit extra, to have a little bit extra chance of success. Fate points, or a luck stat, or what have you. So we threw in an extra statistic called risk, which you can burn for bonuses, or extra damage, or rerolls. Uh, if you have magical or psionic powers, risk is that resource that you draw on to power those. It's a good system. It works. It's a lot of fun. Uh, you can get risk back by doing incredibly dangerous, stupid things and taking a chance you're going to take damage. But, oh my gosh, you get risk back and everyone at the table jumps up and yells, Refill! And you move on. Over about seven years, we've written over 200 supplements for hot chicks. Uh, things that advanced a, a meta plot for the whole game world, uh, introducing new characters and new villains and rules variation. There is some material in it which is adult-oriented, somewhat mature. I'm going to put half of that down to we were young and needed the money, and half of that down to it's not the first game to address mature and objectionable material. Uh, 
it's one where we did it pretty carefully. I mean, every book where there is material that people could find objectionable or distasteful, there are disclaimers and suggestions on how to use the material delicately, how to communicate with your players, how to make sure that you're not offending one at the table, and when to just not use the book on the sales pages for these things. We often suggest, if the things that are in this book offend you, please don't buy it. Well, it's a game system called Hot Chicks. When it first came out, people were saying that we didn't go quite far enough in how we addressed the adult material. We tried to draw a line where we keep it risque, but not pornographic. And because people did suggest that we hadn't gone far enough, well, we put out a supplement called Inner Darkness, which had those more objectionable materials in it, along with an awful lot of disclaimers, and honest to gosh, a picture in the back that I drew of me looking off into the sunset thoughtfully and Vic feeding a baby goat just to have a counterpoint to all the darkness and gritty sex stuff in the book. And people did seem to think that that was more appropriate. A portion of our um, readership thought that we still hadn't gone quite far enough. That was as far as I was going to go. We've addressed those things as time has gone on. Again, no real controversy, just a couple of pithy, opinionated posts on RPG Net every so often, which I tried to answer diplomatically. Time went on, and we were obviously never going to get this product out to a large group of people. It's a niche product in a niche market with a niche following. It's never going to be something mainstreamable, which is fine. As a first effort, I'm still kind of proud of it. But time went on, six or seven years, and we started to think that perhaps it was time to address a uh, wider audience, do something more family-oriented. At the same time, you know, we, we were looking into entering different genres of gaming. Maybe we wanted to write a fantasy game. Or, uh, or, or a space game, because Vic and I are both big space gamers, and fantasy games are what really drives the foundation of the RPG market. And then we started to notice our personal groups, the games that we were in, doing something unusual with hot chicks. We'd get other games and start playing other games, and people would roll dice and look down and go, God, I wish we were doing this in hot chicks instead. Because the game worlds were just fine, but well, the systems didn't make you want to jump and shout. So, we created Icosahedron, a game system named for the D20. It was going to take everything that we learned from Hot Chicks and boil it down into a neat, efficient, simple system. And then someone said the stupidest thing I've ever heard anyone say. When discussing this name with a group of our friends, someone, a teacher for God's sake, said, gosh, icosahedron kind of sounds like a disease. Which, which it doesn't. I'm sorry. I, I, I don't care how far you got in geometry. Icosahedron's the name for a 20-sided solid enough. It didn't get the wow factor. However, one of the things about the system we were using is that it did, if you pushed your character, if you took chances, if you're willing to take the damage, willing to take risk, you could usually achieve victory. The victory system. This is the core rule book of the victory system. It is much thinner than Hot Chicks, the role-playing game, coming in at 287 pages. It includes everything you need for character generation, all the mechanics for the game, dealing with task resolution, combat, um, 
hazards. It has elementary equipment for fantasy, near modern, and space role playing games. The basics that you need for magic, psionics, martial arts, mechanica, which is a more generic term for cyberware, and general powers. Superpowers, alien powers, monster powers, what have you. Uh, there's a very brief bit about how to use it to generate settings and some sample adventures. <sighs> and some guidelines for using it to run the game that you want to run. One of the last things I want a role-playing game to do to me is to tell me how to play my game. I'm never going to play a game out of any of these books exactly the way this book tells me to do it. I'm going to find a rule that I don't like. Oh my gosh, your initiative is stupid. I'm going to do it my way. I'm, I'm not going to draw a little diagram and make little counters on my players just to generate an initiative score. No. I'm going to roll a number, and the guy next to me is going to roll one, and however it goes, we're going to start at the GM's left and go around the table, because that's easy. So, everything in the victory system is a suggestion. If you follow it, you'll have a gaming experience like I have when I play this game with my friends, or the people around me, or when I demo it at conventions. But, play it the way you want to play it. Tell me what your experience with it is. And we could change things. Every so often we put out a book called Alternate Victory, which has alternate rules and different ways to use the system. When we wrote Hot Chicks, I created a Bible this thick for how to make every piece of equipment in the book. How to make any piece of equipment. There were notes in there for making computers and pistols and ray guns and eyeglasses and costume jewelry. Uh, there, there were rules in there for generating the cost for the coatings on your eyeglasses. Although I did editorialize a little bit in that and included the ultraviolet coating, which scratches the... Uh, low light coating, which scratches, and the scratch resistant coating, which scratches. I bought a lot of eyeglasses in my time. It was big, it was exhaustive, it was huge, and oh my god, I could never have published anything like that. I... Hot Chicks lacked a couple of things that we put into the victory system. One, things in Hot Chicks are listed in the order that we thought of them. In the victory system, I thought the alphabet would be a better way to put things in order. Uh, in uh, Hot Chicks, the power, the costs for superpowers and magic spells and whatever was generated by a system that Vic and I used. Yeah, that sounds right. So the victory system uses a far more consistent system for pricing and a far more simplified version of uh, formulas for generating equipment. That we were able to put together in the Victory System Equipment Manual. Now, what that book does is let you make everything in the system. Absolutely everything in the system. Guns, swords, armor, knives, clothes, an opera cloak, a Lamborghini, a spaceship, a three-master ocean vessel, Potions, magic swords, magic ray guns, superpowers, cybernetics, magic spells. Uh, the keys to the kingdom, as it were, you can make anything you need to out of this book, with a lot of caveats about what constitutes breaking a game and why the game master should check every piece of paper associated with what a player wants to run in the game. Side note. This is my symbol for a tangent. It's supposed to be like a circle, and it's supposed to be like the line that goes off the side. Tangent. I have seen so many games wrecked by a game master not reading the player's character sheet. I granted, yet that last few minutes before the game starts, and everyone's like, here's my character, okay, here's my character, okay, here's my character, okay. And a lot of game masters was, yeah, okay, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, okay, yeah, we're good. Now you got to read. Oh my lord, you have to read those. 
Otherwise, you end up with a whole bunch of players that you can't hurt, an adventure that doesn't actually go anywhere, and someone's got something that can end the adventure by pushing a button. And if someone turns off the adventure you spent two weeks writing by pulling out a gizmo and pressing a button on it, and then shows you on the character sheet that you approved the piece of equipment that says it turns off your adventure, that is not the player's fault. Just saying. Back on track. Well, the victory system allowed us to have a second go, refine things. You can find Hot Chicks the Role Playing Game at RPGnow.com or DriveThroughRPG.com. It's uh, it's priced at pay what you want. You can have it for free if you want to. Drop me a couple of bucks if you think it's worth. It's still a good game, and there's still a lot of supplements based on it. We just released 2018 The War for Hell. It caps off the storyline and the product line from Hot Chicks, the role-playing game. After seven years, it was about time. Not that we're done telling the story, but uh, we are going to be moving it ahead with a more family-friendly, uh, mainstream-oriented setting called Destiny 2025. And now that we've capped off the Hot Chicks product line, we've done a number of books in Victory, and we've combined the Victory product lines and the Hot Chicks product lines for a while, uh, because it sucked having to work with two different sets of mechanics. But now, uh, moving on, we're going to start generating the setting books, the default fantasy and default near-modern and default space settings for the Victory system which are going to be very interesting projects indeed. Because your setting is where you actually sell your system. When your settings come out, then you can grow off from there and have extra characters and villains and adventures and, and other places within that setting to grow those game worlds. And yeah, we're nuts. We're going to be doing three at a time. Which is fine. In many ways, this is my baby. It's my second child, and my first child is... Still something I am very proud of. It's something that has a life of its own. Every so often, someone will tag me on Facebook or online and uh, let me know that they've had Hot Chicks games that involve the characters in these games. I've had friends run Hot Chicks games for me. And uh, it does have a life of its own. People have very involved, very deep, very fun games with hot chicks. And I'm looking forward to hearing more of those stories. I am even more looking forward to giving people other environments to play in. Uh, I am looking forward to a point in time when we've got the setting books out where I'm going to let other people start writing material for this system. Because... There is going to be no limit to how much room there is for creativity and other things to happen. in it. More. I want competition. I want a lot of competition. I, I want to see people write their own role-playing games. Every so often someone does approach me about a project that they're working on. They're just a share their ideas with me, where it's going, what's happening, how it's working out. And I love that. Oh, God, I love that. Role-playing games are something that mean a lot to me. Growing up with learning disabilities that weren't diagnosed for quite some time, and not being terribly socially able, I was trapped in my head for a long time. I tried writing. Writing was about as close as I could get to actually getting it out, but that was putting the worlds in my head out there, but I couldn't actually share them. I could let people see them, but I couldn't let people be in them. It was still just that place in my head. And if people thought the writing was weird, then my head was weird. And, well, there were issues in therapy of Then I discovered role-playing games. 
And my uh, my dad took me to a science fiction gaming store in downtown St. Louis, bought me my first box set of Traveler. And it was never the same. Now I had a format where not only could I have these stories in terms that other people could understand and mechanics for accomplishing things in those stories, but ways and means for me to sit down with a group of other people and put the story out there and invite them to participate. To let other people walk around in these worlds in my head. I owe Gary Gygax a huge debt of thanks. Not just Gary Gygax, but the other luminaries of the system. Monty Cook, Steve Jackson, Kevin Chambeda. There are more names than I can list. And the least that I could do, given the skill set that I found myself uh, possessing, was try and do as they'd done. Try and write something that put part of me into this. Become a part of the hobby. Become a part of the industry. I was very upset when a whole bunch of games did unreasonable things, in my opinion, and tanked themselves. When the Curse of the Fourth Edition hit, and a few other games came out that should have been absolutely brilliant, but just weren't for one reason or another, it was time. It was time for me to you know, not give myself any more excuses. Write a role-playing game. Write a couple. Write material for them. Get it out there. At this point in history, you have no better opportunity to get a role-playing game on the market than right now. Because no longer do you have to farm out to a publisher or a distributor. Uh, do you have to worry about the expense of printing books, warehousing books, distributing books, selling them to retail outlets? And that's a very, very complicated business process that I'm not capable of. You know, it's more complicated than I can really deal with. I'm an artist and a craftsman. I don't have a head for business. But you can go to a number of sites online. I've mentioned a couple. Drive through RPG, RPG now. And uh, give them a sample of your stuff, and chances are you may just find yourself able to sell your games in electronic format online. The electronic gaming market is wonderful. It's not going to make you a ton of money unless you're phenomenally successful. It buys me a cheeseburger every so often. As time goes on, it buys me very good cheeseburgers, but I got 200 products on the market. But you can get out there. You can put those worlds that are yours, that are stuck up here, in front of a market that everyone in the world can see. You can share what is stuck in your head with potentially thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people. And frankly, you should. If you've got a game in your head, if you've got a world in your head that you really want to share, share it. If you've got a game in your head, if you have a world in your head, if you've built a place that you want other people to get that fan rage piece of real estate for, write it and I'll come. You need a writer. You need an artist. They can be the same person. They are in my case. Um, you need someone who can do layout. You need someone who can edit and proofread. Again, in my case, that's usually still both me. And 
a little software investment, something that lets you write and lay stuff out. And you can do it in Word these days. Uh, I use Adobe and uh, Adobe's InDesign uh, because they don't make all this page maker anymore. You need to be able to produce your material in a PDF. Get it out there. If you can do it in text only, you can put it up on Amazon. This has been more or less the history of how I got to where I'm at. Uh, what I do is I sit down my my role playing games. In the future, I will produce some more videos on how things work specifically in my game and go into details of character generation and mechanics and combat resolution. And I've had some help putting together footage for that. So that should be a lot of fun. But in the meantime, one, I invite you to pursue your creative endeavors wherever you feel they're going to take you. Art, writing, sculpture, and a lot of people who make jewelry. And, well, there's online outlets for that, too, at the moment. Make something. Put it out there. You'll be amazed. Absolutely amazed. Heck, make videos on YouTube. You never know. People might actually start watching them. I met a moment, too. Thank you for watching. I'm Scott Quorum. This is what matters to me. And I'll see you next time on the next Matters of Decorum. Jolly hello! Did you know that in ye olde steampunky times, artists and authors of all type could get themselves a patron or someone who helps to pay to support them while they practice their arts? Even if their arts were hunting vampires. Today, we have a slightly different system. We have the Patreon account, where you can go and pledge support to people who write role-playing game supplements, produce fanciful art, or even make wonderful YouTube videos. Why don't you go to this telephonic address of place to go and see about contributing to this particular individual's wonderful Patreon account. You won't be sorry. You'll get special things that other people who don't go to this place simply won't have the opportunity to get, and you'll be supporting an artist who makes things like this. Thank you very much, and consider to being a Patreon!